continuing to look at a letter written to the early Jewish Christians we call the book of Hebrews. We've been going through it together for a number of weeks now, and even as we look at this book, in some cases it can seem pretty complex, difficult to understand. There's some deep theological themes in this book of Hebrews, but when you really step back and take that thousand foot look at it, it's actually a pretty simple, straightforward letter, or as we call it, a book. This book, this letter is written to really say one thing above everything else that it says. Jesus is better. Right? Jesus is better. He's better than all that has come before him. He is better than all the earthly things that will come. Jesus is better. You can summarize this whole book as we've been saying through this series that Jesus changes all things because Jesus is over all things. Jesus Christ is better. He's superior to Moses, to Joshua, to Aaron. He's a better high priest than Aaron was. He's a better high priest than even Melchizedek, who we looked at last week. And now we come to this chapter that in some ways is a culmination of everything that is said in the previous chapters before. We're going to see this morning that Jesus is not only a better high priest, but that he's a mediator of a better covenant, a new covenant that will replace the old. That's the big idea, the point of this entire chapter, is that the new covenant that Jesus brings is better than the old covenant that they have been under. You have to remember, and in we see it from our eyes, right, from the year 2023, but go all the way back to the time that this was written. They were new Christians, Jews that had followed the traditions and the laws of the old covenant and the old ways, which ranged from the sacrifices in the temples to all the feasts to all the different aspects of that old covenant. And now they're being told that there's a new covenant. And they're trying to walk in that. They're trying to understand that. But, but in moving from the old to the new, they're being persecuted. They're being challenged. They're coming into trials and tribulations. Anybody here face some struggles and trials? Come on. They're facing them in a big way. And so they're being tempted to go back to the old traditions, the old ways, the things that they're more comfortable with with, the things that they're used to, the things that they better understand. If we're honest with each other this morning, how many of us do the same? Don't we lean into the things we're more comfortable with, kind of stay in our comfort zone, lean into the things that we understand, that we can wrap our eyes or our arms around and, and just get a grip on? We can kind of drift that way ourselves. And, and so these early Christian Jews were, were really in danger of doing that, going back to the traditions of the old way and walking under that old covenant. But as we look at this eighth chapter of Hebrews this morning, its purpose is to contrast that old covenant with the new covenant and to show them that the new covenant is superior to the old and to show them why the new covenant is better, not just to say, yeah, it's better, trust me, but why it is better, what makes it better, and why they, as well as we here this morning, should embrace and walk in the new covenant rather than the legalism of the old. And so that's where we're going this morning as we look at this eighth chapter of Hebrews. And I couldn't think of a better place to start than Hebrews 8.1. It just seems like a great place for me to start the chapter. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, chapter 8, verse 1. We're pretty much this morning going to go through most of the chapter. And so you can just stay there. I'll kind of take some threads off into some other directions. But if you're in Hebrews 8 this morning, whether it's in your paper Bible or your app, you'll be with us most of the time as far as the Scriptures. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 says this. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, 
not man. It starts right out of the gate by saying, now the point in what we are saying is this. We've talked about all of these things that have come before. We, we've talked about Aaron. We've talked about Moses. We've talked about the priesthood and the high priesthood. We've talked about Melchizedek. We talked about Jesus being the ultimate high priest who is sinless, appointed by God. And then it says, now, the point in what we're saying Now, to wrap all of that up that we've been saying, let's move forward. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Again, step back and try to put yourself in the shoes or sandals, as the case may be, of the ones that were receiving this letter back in their day. There was still a functioning temple. There was still a functioning priesthood. There were still sacrifices being made at the temple. There was still a high priest in the temple. And the writer of Hebrews comes along and says, no, there is the high priest. The. And if I'm one of those Jews of that day, I can see myself asking, what do you mean there's another high priest? I can point to mine. He's right over in the temple in Jerusalem, functioning right now, serving right now. He's a high priest serving. Show me your high priest. Well, my high priest, the high priest, the writer of Hebrews tells us, is not in an earthly temple in Jerusalem made by the hands of man. It's not where you'll find the high priest. He's in a much better place, specifically seated at the right hand of the throne. It says, of the majesty in heaven. He's not a high priest that serves in that building made by man. He serves from a seat in heaven. He serves and fulfills the role of high priest from there. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Church, you and I have a high priest. It's the high priest serving us from an eternal temple that will never end. He's serving us from heaven. But notice, and as I was reading this, this just jumped out at me. Notice his posture. He's not kneeling in heaven. He's not standing in heaven. He is seated in heaven. Don't overlook that detail. If you look at the tabernacle, it was patterned after what God gave Moses on the Mount of Mount Sinai. It was patterned after heaven. Everything in there. It'll say in a short time was a shadow of the reality of heaven. So it's all representing the heavenly courts, let's just say. And as you look at that pattern of the temple, you'll see there are a lot of features that they were required to put in the temple that God told them to put there. A lot of furnishings that were supposed to be there. But as you read through it, one of the things you might not have noticed is there's no instructions for any seating or bench in the temple. Right? There's no ornate bench for the priests to sit on because they serve in the tabernacle where the work is never done. The sacrifices being made in that temple weren't permanent. They were temporary. And so people would bring their sacrifices over and over again Week after week, month after month, year after year. The work in the temple was never done. Have you ever worked that kind of job where if the boss found you sitting, he knew you were just messing around and taking a break you shouldn't be? Come on, I have. Like a few of you have, right? It's like, have you been caught sitting? Come on, let's just be real with each other, right? Busted, right? Like, oh man, and you know, hey, get up, get back to work. When you go to in and out I was thinking about this the other day, too. You go to in and out which I think ties beautifully with the fatted calf and the meat and the sacrifice. Oh. But when you go to in and out one of the things you'll notice is you can see over the counter, and you can see all the work being done behind the counter. They don't hide it behind doors. And you can see them taking the potatoes and making fries. You can see them making and cooking the meat there and doing all the different things they do. But as you look back behind that counter at the work they're doing, one thing you will not see it in and out in the back is a seat. It's the same idea. The work is never done. 
There's always more to cook. There's always more to do. There's always fries to be made, burgers to be made, customers waiting at the counter, waiting for their food. And if there isn't a customer, there's things to be cleaned in preparation for the next person to walk in. There's always something to do with the work never fully being done. And that's a bit like the priesthood in the Old Testament. They always had to be working. They always had to be sacrificing because there was no sacrifice that was permanent. There was no sacrifice that was enough. And so people had to keep coming back. There's no seats in the temple. Hebrews 8.3 says, For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. That's what they do. Thus, It is necessary for this priest to also have something to offer. It's necessary for Jesus to have something to bring to the altar to offer the high priest. Remember, that's who he's speaking to. So what did Jesus do? Jesus is our high priest. And he needs to offer a sacrifice. But he offers a sacrifice that is so perfect, it'll never have to be offered again. He didn't come with a bull, a goat, or any other kind of sacrifice. He brought the perfect lamb that takes away the sins of the world. He brought himself to the altar. He sacrificed himself. Jesus is not only our high priest seated in heaven, functioning in that position, but he's also the perfect lamb that sacrificed himself for you and for me. That made atonement for our sin. He was the atonement that was offered on the altar. Hebrews 8, 4, and 5. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy of the shadow of heavenly things. Again, that idea of what they do is just a shadow of the reality of the things in heaven. They're temporary, where heaven is eternal. They're a copy, a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. The early Christians would travel far and wide to go to the temple that Solomon had made. A temple made for God that housed the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies where in that day God dwelt. That temple again was patterned after the instructions of the pattern that that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. The Jews took pride in that building. It was an earthly temple testimony to God's greatness and God's glory. It was awesome to behold. But as great as it was, it was a shadow of the heavenly temple and heavenly things. It was temporary. And as mighty as that temple was, as awesome as it was, as glorious as it was, it would eventually be destroyed. It would eventually be gone. Jesus didn't go to a temple made by earthly hands, by human hands, to offer himself there. Jesus offered himself as a perfect atonement, a perfect sacrifice, it says, before the throne of God in heaven. The old covenant required temporary sacrifices that were offered in temporary temples made by human hands overseen by temporary priests and high priests that would come and go throughout the ages. But the new covenant, the new covenant that we're looking at is overseen by an eternal high priest based on the foundation of a perfect sacrifice, an eternal sacrifice made on a cross before the throne of God in heaven. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was both the high priest bringing the offering and the offering itself as the perfect Lamb of God that again takes away the sins of the world, yours and mine, past, present, and future. And so we have a high priest in Jesus Christ who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. 
Hebrews 8, 6, it continues, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates or arbitrates is better since it's enacted on better promises. Saying the new covenant is better than the old covenant because it's enacted on better promises. There's better promises for us, you and I, in the new covenant than there was the old And that leads to the question, all right, fair, what are those promises? Right, what are those promises for you and me? Where practically does this hit the road? Before we look at the better promises to be had, we need to understand the shortcomings of the old covenant. Hebrews 8, 7 goes on, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. If it had been without fault, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. Well, let me ask you, what was the fault of the old covenant? What was the problem with it? Short answer, me. Short answer, you. We were the problem with the old covenant. You see, if I was truly spiritually transformed and walking with the Lord in wholeness and completeness and without hesitation, if I was perfect... I could keep the law and I wouldn't need Jesus. Some of you, most of you already know, and if you don't already know, you'll find out soon enough, I'm not perfect. I'm just not there. And can I be honest with you this morning? You're not either. We're not perfect. We fall short of the glory of God, each and every one of us. So what was the problem with the old covenant with the law? It was that we couldn't keep it. See, there was nothing wrong with the law itself. The law was perfect. The law perfectly showed us the path for living for Christ. Psalm 19, 7 and 8, the law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. There was nothing wrong with the law, and there is nothing wrong with the law. It's perfect. The problem is us. And if there's any problem with the law of the old covenant or the old covenant itself, it's that it does nothing to help us live it out. There's nothing to help us walk in it. The weight of it is on us to keep. It gives us no power to keep it, yet the new covenant is better because the new covenant does something the old covenant didn't. It transforms us. It empowers us. It helps us to live it out. In the remainder of the chapter of Hebrews, the writer is going to quote a prophecy from Jeremiah written 600 years before the new covenant was even enacted on the cross by Jesus. 600 years the covenant was promised to come, and there's other scriptures that speak to it as well, but the writer of Hebrews is going to use this prophecy of Jeremiah to make his point of the new covenant being better, and I want to read it to you this morning. It's Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. It's the next part of Hebrews in its entirety. And then I want to kind of look at just a couple things that I want you to see in it. It says this in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers. On the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And then he says this. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. The old 
the old covenant is all about our performance and our ability to keep the law. The old covenant contained the law perfectly, but it couldn't help us to obey it. It could show everyone the sinfulness that they walked in in bright neon. When I picture that, I think 80s, right? Bright neon colors, greens and pinks. Just our sin stands out when we compare our lives to the law. And yet even though it caused our sins to be bright and neon, it couldn't help us overcome the sinful nature that we had. In fact, Paul writes in his second letter to the Corinthian church in chapter 3, these words, the ministry of death carved in the letters of stone. It's a ministry of death carved in stone. Why? Not because the law was imperfect, but because we couldn't keep it. Because there was no way we could live up to it. Where the old covenant condemned, the new covenant enables. The new covenant is better because it transforms us that are under it. That have put our lives in Christ. It gives us victory over our sin. A sin that the old covenant could only point out. How awesome is that? Hebrews 6.10 or 8.10 For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I'll write them on their hearts. The new covenant reaches into our chest and pulls out our heart of stone and replaces it with a living, beating heart. A new heart that has God's laws written on it. How many of us have been convicted knowing we were going down a path of sin. We knew it, but we chose to walk it anyway. It's because God's law is written on our heart and the Holy Spirit is convicting us as we head in the wrong direction. Or maybe your heart convicted you because that law is written there and you're like, yep, nope, not going down that path. I'm going this way because I know. I know this doesn't glorify God. I know this doesn't honor God. His law is written on your heart. Whereas the old covenant was written on tablets of stone. And again, he's, he's referencing the Ten Commandments here. They so per, per, perfectly encapsulate the law of God, simply and perfectly. Four of them about worshiping God, six of them about loving one another. Under the new covenant, that law is written on our hearts. God transforms us from the inside out. That's the promise of the new covenant. A second one is... This, that we have a new relationship with God. He continues, quoting Jeremiah in Hebrews 8, 10 through 11, And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, I know or know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, regardless of your standing in our culture, regardless if you're considered poor or rich or least or great. Regardless of how you're seen, you can have a relationship with God because we can all know him. Under the new covenant, we don't have to go to somebody else. Again, remember the context of the letter. They went to priests. They went to the temple. They went there to be with God. But that veil's torn. Those middlemen are removed We now are here as pastors and elders to shepherd, to lead, to teach. But you can have your own relationship with God whether I'm on this stage or not. You don't need me to get there. The veil is torn and you can be forgiven and you can hear from God and you can know God directly. So not only is there an inner transformation under the new covenant with the new law being written on your heart, but it will give you a new intimate relationship with God that you could not have had under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. There was a separation there. And then the third thing our writer points out in Hebrews 8, 12, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Even as we fall short of keeping the law under the new covenant, When we do fall short, when we find ourselves walking in sin, we just go to God, we repent, we're forgiven. 
we're still saved. We don't lose our salvation when we make a mistake, when we walk in a sin. Under the new covenant, we're still under Christ because of what he did for us on the cross. Our sins, what it's saying is it was removed from the ledger. There's no longer a debt owed there because Jesus paid that debt for us. It's erased. It's moved from the debt owed to the debt paid column. It's gone. God remembers our sin no more because Jesus paid for it on the cross for you and for me. So when we confess our sins and we repent of them, we turn to his way of thinking our sin is covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are covered in his righteousness, not our own self-righteousness. The new covenant is better than the old covenant, and this is just a short glimpse of why. But it gives us three powerful reasons and promises of why it's better. And we're going to worship together in a song in just a moment as we have each week. But we're going to do one song. And as we worship together, we're going to pass out the elements because we're going to take communion together this morning as a church. And so here's what I would ask During this song, as the communion's passed out, please stay seated and don't stand until after the elements have passed you so that, you know, there isn't this awkwardness of standing and sitting and, you know, the weirdness, right? You know. So just stay in your seats until it's gone by, and then if you're led, stand up and continue worshiping the Lord together. But after this next song, we're going to take communion together in remembrance of the new covenant that we've been looking at and talking about this morning that we have in Jesus's blood. And I would ask you, during this next song, to just take a moment and to ask yourself, be honest with yourself and be honest before the Lord and ask yourself these questions. Do you have these three things? Has your heart been transformed? Is God's law truly written on your heart? Have you asked Jesus to make you a new creation, putting your faith in him and received that from him? Do you have that special intimate relationship with Christ knowing the veil is torn? Have you received the forgiveness of sins that God has for you? Can you say in your life that your sins are remembered no longer, that the debt is paid, and you no longer carry the weight of them? And again, to put all that together, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and received those promises of the new covenant? If not, why not? Do it this morning. Put your faith in Christ. And if you're not sure what that looks like, we will have prayer partners on the wall that you can go to and say the words. Nicodemus said, what must I do to be saved? Right? What does that look like? Simply put your faith in Jesus Christ. Trust in him and him alone for your salvation, believing that he died on a cross for you that we've been talking about and that your sins are remembered no more. But I expect most of you here this morning have probably put your faith in Christ. You've been walking with the Lord. But let me challenge you with this. Are you walking in the promises of the new covenant? Are you truly walking in them? Do you walk in the newness of life, the transformed heart that God has given you? Are you drawing near to him through prayer and through his word each and every day? Knowing the veil has been torn, you no longer need somebody as an intermediary. You can go directly to Jesus and have an intimate relationship with him. Do you take advantage of that every single moment of every single day to walk with Christ? Or are you distracted by other things? Are you letting past sins hang over you and condemn you and weigh you down? Even though Jesus had paid the price for them and he remembers them no longer. Do you hold on to what Jesus has forgiven? Do you need to lay those things down? Say, I'm not going to carry them anymore. Jesus paid the price for them. It's done. My debt is paid in Christ. I'm going to walk in newness of life, not carrying the weight, not remembering those 
sins. Forgive yourself even as Christ has forgiven you. Walk in the promises of the new covenant that Jesus allowed you to be a part of when he died on the cross for you and for me and let go of the shortcomings of the old covenant. Amen?